Welcome into the sanctuary of the City of Refuge Christian Church of Northwest Indiana. The Bible says in John 8.32 that you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So get your Bible and follow along as Pastor Pernal brings forth the words of life. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship, this time of praise, this time of worship this time of celebration and thanksgiving for how good you are, Father. Now, God, we pray for instructions. We pray that your word will go forth. God, that it will impart purpose in our life. God, in the name of Jesus, that souls will be saved, delivered, set free, move in only a way that you can in each and every one of our individual lives. It starts with us as an individual. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we go into this series I, I want to burn a thought in your brain as of what is my why? Why do I do this? Why do I do church? Why is it that God allows me to live? What is my why? I want you to ask yourself, what is your why in the kingdom? What is your why today? I want you to understand your why. Another raise the phrase that what is my purpose? Why do we as a body of Christ exist? Why do I as an individual, what, exist? And so I want to somewhat dig through the book of Nehemiah and deal with a few things that I think will be a blessing to the body of Christ when it deals with our whys. The text scripture will come from Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6, I want to read the first three verses. But the verse that I want to highlight is Nehemiah 6 and 3. But in Nehemiah 6 and 1, the New Living Translation, it says, Sanballat, Tobiah, the Geshem of Arab, and the rest of thy enemies, our enemies, found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps, say no gaps, no gaps remain, though we had yet set up the doors and the gates. We'll talk about them gates later, but I want you to understand there was no gaps. As we function in the body of Christ, there should be no gaps. Now, I want you to understand there are gaps, but there should not be gaps. And you got to ask yourself, what gap am I to fill? Y'all not working with me. So Sanballat and, uh, and Gershom sent a message asking me, talking about Nehemiah, we to, to, to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they was plotting to harm me. So verse 3 says, So I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come down. Why should I stop working? To come and meet with you. We want to take a topic of keep doing a good work. Don't let anything, anyone, stop you and hinder you from doing what? A good work. Now, if we go back to Nehemiah chapter 1. I want to get there, and I'd like for you to get there. In Nehemiah chapter 1, I'm going to read the first three verses of chapter 1 as well. I'll read it in the New King James, and then I'll also read it in the New Living Translation. The New King James says, The word of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislov in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the citadel, the Han and I, one of my brethren, came with me from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, or you know, the pandemic, I mean, you know, the, the captivity had, had survived what's going on crazy in this life, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province there are in great distress and reproach. 
And the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are what? Burned with what? Fire. In other words, Nehemiah did not get a good report on the condition of his what? Nation. The New Living Translation says these are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hilkiah, in late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Xerxes' reign. I was at the fortress of Susa. Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came to visit with me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah, and I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things was going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well. For those who return to the province of Judah, they are in great trouble and, and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem have been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by what? Fire. When was the last time, just as an individual, we concerned ourselves with the current state of our brothers, our sisters, and the community in which we live. When was the last time we took purposeful moments of prayer and meditation on what's really going on? And not only what's really going on, what can I, as an individual, do about it? You know, this 4th of July time represents when the 13 colonies, initial, original 13 colonies of this country, signed a Declaration of Independence that they was free from the British rule. Is that right? I'm just wondering, because I'm not a history teacher today, what is the spiritual and moral state of our country today? I'm not even going to go to 1776. Let me go to 1964 when I was born. 1964 when I was born, stores didn't open on Sundays because there was church. People didn't have to work because the mall needed them there so that the doors could be open. People went to church. In today's time, Church it has become a byproduct. If I have time, I'll go. Nehemiah is not in a good situation. I, I, I got to, to sort of warn you that today's message could be um, hard to listen to. Michael Snyder, if you ever heard of him, is a founder and a publisher of the Economic Collapse blog and End of the American Dream. Michael's shocking new book about the last days entitled The Rapture Verdict. You can get that in paperback. You can get it on Kindle or Amazon. But he began to, to talk about the, the moral spiritual and moral decline of the nation that you and I now live. Nehemiah, I want you to understand that things are not good. The collection of facts and statistics that you are about to, to hear are highly controversial. A lot of people are going to be greatly upset by what I'm getting ready to read. Why? Because they don't like to be confronted with the truth about the America that we live in. I'm talking about America and not Japan because we live in America. 
I'm not talking about Spain, Italy. I'm not talking about Africa. I'm talking about America. The America that you and I live in. Most people tend to believe that we can fix this country by getting the right politicians into power or by implementing certain economic or social reforms. But the reality of the matter is, is that our problems go far deeper than that. A moral collapse is eating away at the foundations of our society like a cancer. I want you to understand, Nehemiah, that things are not good. I want you to understand, church, that this is not about you as a church. I'm just trying to give you your why. I'm trying to let you know that you're living at the most important time of history, that you're going to be able to take answers from here and take it to there. This is not about a condemnation of the body of Christ. This is about activation of the body of Christ. This is about focusing the body of Christ to let you know that you and I have a good work that we must continue. So as I read this, I don't want you to receive this as this is a condemnation on you. This is about the community and the society of which we live. Are you working with me? Now, some of this stuff might step on your toes. It's not intended. It's just to let you know that when you leave those doors, drive off of this lot, you got to work to do. You're working with me. You know, I gave the men gloves the other Sunday on Father's Day. That was a setup because you got to do something with them gloves. If if, if it continues to go unchecked, it would inevitably destroy America. Unfortunately, fixing moral decay is far more difficult than switching out political parties because it is in the hearts of hundreds of millions of individuals in America. And most people don't want to hear anything about moral collapse because most people like to think that the United States is setting a good example to the rest of the planet. But as you're getting ready to hear in your eyes, you're going to have some shocking information. If we, was to honest, if, if we are honest with ourselves, we see the evidence of moral collapse around us every day. Listen to these things that have happened in our society. What would cause a high school kid to take two kitchen knives and go on a stabbing rampage through his high school? What would cause a topless woman to ranshap a McDonald's in St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg, Florida? What would cause two 18-year-old boys to beat a 30-year-old mentally disabled man to death with a baseball bat just so they can get his Xbox? What would cause a new father to put a six-week-old daughter in a freezer to keep her from crying. Y- y'all see, I see how, you, you, you know, it's horrible, but see, it's an activation. It, it is a, it's a mandate and a call on the body of Christ to what? Do something about it. Are, are you working with me? A lot of people regard those kind of stories as isolated incidents, but as you will see below, they're actually representation of a much larger trend. As a society, we are decaying from the inside out. And we need to start facing the truth if we're ever going to get this thing turned around. The following are facts about moral collapse in America that are almost too crazy to even believe what I'm getting ready to read to you. But I want to read it to you because I want to empower you with purpose. I want to encourage you to identify your why so that we can be a solution and not a problem. Are we okay? I know right now I'm not in the scripture, but I'm going to get into some scriptures. But I want to deal with some facts of what's happening in our society that we represent so we can leave here with passion and purpose. Can I read? Are y'all bored with me right now? It says approximately one third of the entire population of the United States, 110 million people currently have sexually transmitted diseases according to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. Why? Because when you go and check in the post office, I mean to the health department, they report those stats and they keep those stats. Do you understand what I'm saying? Every single year, there are 20 million new STD cases in America. America has the highest 
STD infection rate in the entire world. Americans in the 15 to 24 year of age group account for about 50% of all new STD cases each year. It costs our nation approximately $16 billion a year to treat sexually transmitted diseases alone. According to one survey, 24% of all U.S. teens have STDs say that they still have unprotected sex. Shouldn't be having sex at all. But they're not teaching your kids that in school now. In fact, they're teaching your kids sexuality before they're even thinking about sexuality, and they're telling them they don't even have to be, consider themselves what they were born to be. They're indoctrinating your kids in elementary school right now to say, if, you want to, if you're a boy and you want to be a girl, that's fine. Be that. If you're a girl and want to be a boy, that's fine. Be that. That's in the curriculum in your kid's school right now. Come on, come on, we're working with this, right? In Chicago public schools, kindergarten teachers are now required to set aside 30 minutes a month for sex education. Why would you teach sex education to a kindergarten? The United States has the highest teen pregnancy rate in the entire world. According to a study conducted by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, approximately two-thirds of all Americans in the 15 to 24-year-old age bracket have engaged in oral sex. At this point, one out of every 14 girls in the United States has had at least one sexually transmitted disease. According to the National Centers for Missing and Exploited Children, there are 747,408 registered sex offenders in the United States. There are 106,216 registered sex offenders in the state of California alone. 18% of all the women in the United States say that they have been raped at some point in their lives. Can I keep reading? More than 50% of all rapes that take place within one mile of home. And teens that are in the 16 to 19 year old age bracket are three and a half, more three and a half times more likely than the general population to be the victim of rape, attempted rape, or sexual assault between the ages of 16 to 19. I want to read this because I want our eyes to be wide open as the church. 60% of male sex abuse victims and 80% of female sex abuse victims are abused by someone known to the child and to the child's family. Can I go to so-and-so house? No. Why? You better keep your eyes on your kids. Uh, brother, the most amazing thing happened Sunday, and I loved it. Brother um, Gavin and Sister Bianca was at Lady Linda's my house for dinner. And Braylon was with us, and the girls were having a good time. I said, Sister Bianca, you can leave the kids here if you like. We'll bring them home. She said, oh, no, they're going with us. <laughs> she said, oh, no, they're going with us. Not that anything would have happened, but the vigilance of that parent said, no, no, they're going with us. You don't just let your kids go to overnight at Willie Nilly house just because they're free and you have not stepped foot in that house to know what's going on. I don't care how mad your kids get with you. No, you ain't going. And if you sneak over there and something happened, it was on you, I tried to tell you. That's old-fashioned, isn't it? You don't watch your kids. An astounding 
of all internet traffic now goes to adult websites. 30%. 70% of all men in the 18 to 24 year old age bracket visit at least one adult website each month. 70% of all men. All men. Men in church and out of church. The average high school boy spends two hours on adult websites every week. Every week. High school boy. Ah, they can do what they want to. I just, they can have their phone. I'm not going to check it. That's their room. That's their stuff. I'm not going to check their internet browsing history. I think, yeah, just got to let them be boys. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Man, I can't believe little Johnny got charged with rape. Yeah, after building up all of those hormones looking at that internet two hours a week. At some point, some got to come out somewhere. I like these kids smiling. I like, I, I mean, we, we, we're somewhere now. The reason I'm talking about this, this doesn't get talked about in church very often. But we're going to be the solution. We're not going to be a part of the problem. The lady opened service. She said, Lord, I pray that we get convicted and converted. Now, I feel just a little bit of conviction going on in here. And that's good because I want us to get converted so we can go to work. Hallelujah. No judgment. No judgment. No judgment. Law enforcement fish. Can I keep reading? Are y'all tired of me? Is this boring? Law enforcement officials estimate that about 600,000 Americans and about 65,000 Canadians are trading dirty child pictures online. It has been estimated that 89% of all pornography is produced in the United States. One survey discovered that 25% of all employees that have internet access in America has visited sex websites while they're at work. The marriage rate in the United States has fallen to an all-time low. Right now it's sitting at a yearly rate of 6.8 marriages per thousand people. Just 6.8 per thousand people. In the United States today, more than half of all couples move in together before they get married. Come on now, work with me. Now that definitely shouldn't be in the church, but that's what we're dealing with in society. Well, we just sharing rent. That ain't all you sharing. You sharing slob and everything else too. There's only so often you don't see sister go to the shower and you don't close your eyes. Every once in a while you're gonna tip over there. Come on now, best be real. You can't put fire in the bosom and not be burned. Not surprisingly, at all time low, 44.2% of all Americans in the 25 to 34 year age bracket are married at this point. America has the highest divorce rate in the world by a real good margin. America has the highest percentage of one person households on the entire planet. 100 years ago, 4.52 people was living in the average U.S. household. But now the average U.S. US household only consists of 2.59 people. According to Pew Research Center, only 51% of all American adults are currently married. In 1960, 72% of all adults in the United States was what? Married. Come on now, this, this is the society that we're going to be working with, that we're going to do our good work. That means our marriages need to be so amazing and bring so much glory to God that when people around you, they're going to want to be married. Nobody want to get married. They see you fight. Doop, 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 doop. Boop. 
Get the H out of here. When you get the H out of here too, I can't stand you. Blue, 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 blue. Come on, y'all, let's go to church. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Everybody, praise the Lord. I thank God for my husband, my wife, and your kids sit back and say, And you expect for them to want to grow up and get married? That's why it's declining, because they don't see a good example of a marriage as much as they used to. I'm just reading these stats. Now, I ain't making this up. I ain't telling no story. I'll give you a copy. But see, that's why the body of Christ, we are working on our relationship. We are allowing God to work in and through us so when we go out and people see us, you know, it's, 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 they're not seeing something that's phony. They're seeing genuine stuff. Genuine stuff. Not just a smile on Facebook, but whether you're on Facebook or not, you are working stuff. Are you working with me, saints? Listen, now, we're going to get to the message, but I need you to understand we're doing a good work or why we should be doing a good work or why we should be people of purpose in all of these areas. Does this make sense? For women under the age of 30 in the United States, more than half of all babies are born out of wedlock. They're born out of wedlock. In the world. But do you know what else? Also in the church. Church goers. Banging. Do you know if you're a single sister in the church, you shouldn't be taking birth controls? What you taking them for? What are you on birth control for and you're not married? In 1970, the average woman had her first child when she was 21.4 years old. Now the average woman has her first child when she is 25.6 years old. In a massacre that is almost unspeakable, more than 56 million Americans' babies have been slaughtered in this country since Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973. Now Roe v. Wade has been overturned. Now they're finding other creative ways to kill their babies. Approximately 47% of all women that get an abortion each year in the United States have also had previous abortions. 47%. The number of American babies killed by abortion each year is roughly equal to the number of U.S. military deaths that have occurred in all of the wars of the United States uh, has ever been involved or combined in. About one-third of all American women will have had an abortion by the age of 45. Approximately 3,000 Americans lost their lives as a result of the destruction of the World Trade Center Tower 911. Every single day, more than 3,000 American babies are killed by abortion when you include all forms of abortion. The United States has the highest abortion rate in the Western world. It has been reported that a staggering 41% of all New York City pregnancies end in abortion. Most women that get abortion in the United States claim to be Christian. Most Protestant women get 42% of all abortions, and Catholic women get 27% of all abortions. Why? Because you're sneaking and peeping, and you don't want to show up pregnant in church. Come on. Be quiet. According to Pastor Clinton Childress, approximately 52% of all African-American pregnancies end in abortion. About 18% of all abortions in the United States each year are performed by teenagers. And one, 
very shocking study found that 86% of all abortions are done for the sake of convenience, not physical life threat, not rape, not those things. It's convenience. A Department of Homeland Security report that there was released in January 2012 says that if you are anti-abortion, you are a potential terrorist. If you're anti-abortion, you are a potential terrorist. Some abortion clinics have been caught selling aborted baby parts to medical researchers. Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger once said the following, the most merciful thing that a family does to one of his infant members is to kill it. The most merciful thing you could do to your unborn baby is to kill it. She considered that merciful. But now she is praised in the halls of the U.S. Congress. Planned Parenthood performed more than 300,000 abortions every single year. Planned Parenthood specifically targeted the poor. A staggering 72% of Planned Parenthood customers have incomes that are equal or beneath the 150% of the federal poverty level. And most of those customers live in minority neighborhoods. If you want to challenge that rate, I want you to take a tour of different social and economic communities. And you drive through lower class communities, you're going to see babies everywhere. Then you drive through your most affluent communities and you're going to see tricklings. You want to know why? Because if a man don't know who he is, he tried to get his identity through sexual promiscuity. And all he want to do is screw with no money. Because he thinks when he screw, it gives him power and identity. And the result of that is more born babies. And then you leave a woman high and dry. Now that woman got to take care of the baby and him. But because she loved him, she keeps screwing him and keep on having babies. Come on. This is the society that we live in. I want you to understand when you leave here, you have a purpose and you have a message that you got to take to the community that you live in. You're not going to be liked for it, but you got to tell the truth. We're not just going to praise the Lord in here. We're going to praise him out there and we're going to stand for truth. Where? Out there. We got people in our own family living in promiscuous lives and we don't say nothing to them about it. Oh, that's just Jojo. That's just... No, you need to be saying something about it. Well, I ain't coming to your house no more. Okay. At least when you do come, this is the message you're going to get. All right. All right. We walk around and watch our family living crazy lives and we say nothing. Because we want to be accepted by our families. You love your mother, your father more than you love me. You're not worthy of the kingdom. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. We let people live in our house and don't go to church. And we expect for community to get better. I told Mikey, what Roz is? I saw her walking here. I said, stand up, baby. That's beautiful, too. She's beautiful. Married, too. Go, stand up, girl. Stand up right there. I said, you know what, to my kids? I said, y'all don't have to be saved. Y'all don't have to try to be preacher kids, like running around doing stuff in the church. But if you live here, you go in the church. You ain't got to say nothing. You can sit up in that sleep. You don't even got to fake like you all of that. But if you live in my house, you go to church. Do you know people let people live in their house anymore and they give them options of whether they're going to go to church or not? And expect for there to be change. You're going to suck up my air conditioning, eat my food, and you're going to tell me you ain't going to church. You're getting out of here. You so cold. You so hard. You are not loving. You can say what you want to, but you are out of my house. Where are you going to live? On the street if they have to. They got a nice bed in here. They chose. They chose not to go to church. You ain't, ain't got to preach. You ain't got to act like you say. You just got to go sit in the Word because I know the power of the Word, if it go forth long enough, it's going to change you. I know if you fornicate, at one point it's going to deliver you. If you lie, it's going to get the line. Right. Something is going to happen whether you want it to happen or not. Like some of y'all, y'all listen to what I'm teaching right now? Boy, that word is hard. And you, you listen, oh, my goodness, especially young people. Oh, my goodness. But you can't get away from it now. 
Because I don't know you. I don't know. I don't watch you every day. But this word is what this word is chasing you down right now. This word is going through your peer. It's going up and down. It's going all over the place. I don't know you. You look at me like, man, who are you talking to? I don't know who I'm talking to. But I know that word talking to somebody. Can I keep reading? I'm going to get to the scriptures in a minute. But that's, not, that's what we like to do. We like to cover up our life with scriptures. Can we just talk about the word? No, we're talking about the conditions, the side that we live in right now. <laughs> the FDA is actually considering making it legal for doctors and scientists to create three parent babies in the United States. Don't even, don't even, some of you may even know what that means. I don't even know what that means. An all-time high, 59% of all Americans believe that the traditional definition of marriage needs to be changed. My wife was at an event. Oh, Lord, I don't know who's listening to this, but I don't care. My wife was at an event, and she was talking to a lady, and she assumed that lady had a husband, and she assumed that husband was a man until they were having cabbage cream, and the lady had to, oh, no, no, my husband is a woman. And my wife, okay, okay, all right then. <laughs> she said, oh, okay, all right, you know, <laughs> okay then. That's the society we're living in. I was doing this interview today, was just doing. I said, look, I'm a pastor. As a church, I have a standard. I preach that standard. Somebody come to my church, I preach a godly standard here. It's a standard I uphold. There's a standard in the church. The number of sexual assaults in the U.S. military is at an all-time high and the majority of them are male on male. Male on male. During 2012, more than 85,000 military veterans were formally treated for sexual abuse and they suffered, that they suffered while they were in the military. The number of active members of the U.S. military that killed themselves uh, each year now exceeds the number that are dying on the battlefield. It's true. According to one absolutely shocking study, 22 military veterans kill themselves in the United States every single day. America was the highest incarcer America has the highest incarceration rate and the largest total prison population in the entire world by a very wide margin. Let me just say this and none of you're going to like it. The reason it's like that is because we give too many rights to incarcerated people. McKenzie is getting ready to go to Japan. The life expectancy of a person in prison in Japan is three years. They don't get a college degree. They don't get steak. They don't get chicken and mashed potatoes and green beans. They get fish head juice. Fish head soup is what they get. There's no such thing as police brutality. You get beat down, you get beat down. You're not suing the Japanese government. Because many of them won't even bring out a gun. They just beat you half to death with their billy sticks. And, you, and, and in Japan, your kid can walk the streets without worrying about somebody picking them up and running off with them, though. Because they don't like being put in jail. Being put in jail in this country is like getting a tattoo on the arm or something. It's like a trophy. Yeah, I went to the man, but I'm out now. How good for you, man. This is the society that we work in, saints. This is the stuff that, that, that we, 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 we go with Scripture, but we don't understand what's really going on. I need for you to understand what's going on so you can deal with what needs to be dealt with as the Lord puts you to work. In America today, there are 60 million people that abuse alcohol, and there are 22 million people that use illicit drugs. And that number is, has, has doubled since this thing was given. Incredibly, more than 11% of all Americans that are 12 years of age or older admit that they have driven home under the influence of alcohol at least once during the last year. 
According to a study conducted by Mayo Clinic, nearly 70% of all Americans are on at least one prescription drug. And astounding 20% of all Americans are on at least five prescription drugs. According to the CDC, approximately nine out of every 10 Americans that are at at least 60 years old say they have taken at least one prescription drug within the last month. America spends more than $280 billion on prescription drugs each year. According to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, doctors in the United States write more than 250 million prescriptions for antidepressants each year year. And right now there are 70 million Americans that are on mind-altering drugs of one form or another. Children in the United States are three times more likely to be prescribed antidepressants than children in Europe or anywhere else. And if the parents will start breaking out that belt and whooping the heck out of their kids, they won't need to be put on no medication. You spoil the rod, you, you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And here they go giving your kids all of this stuff in school to modify their behavior. All they need is a whipping. I ain't going to whoop my child. Help yourself. I whoop mine. I ain't had to bail not one of them out of jail. Not one. I, I, in fact, I was over the top. But I had to calm down a little bit. If the truth be told, I had to calm down. In the United States, prescription painkillers kill more Americans than heroin and cocaine combined. America has the highest rate of illegal drug use in the entire planet. According to the federal government, the number of heroin addicts in the United States has more than doubled since 2022. Brother Everett, I'd like for you to look, look in the foyer and give me one of those little Narcan packs. The number of hair-related overdose deaths has risen 84% since 2010. It is hard to believe, but 56% of all Americans now have subprime credit. But before I get to that, there was a day there was never a need for a church to have something like this in the church. But we have to have it now, and I want y'all to start taking this stuff with you. Put at least two of these in your purse. You run out, I get some more. Because the likelihood that some of us might come across somebody that have OD on heroin is very high, and you can save their life with this stuff. You use this stuff, then pray. Get them back to life, then pray. So when you see the stuff in the foyer, make sure you got at least two of them in your purse. Because one won't do enough for in many cases because now this stuff is laced with fentanyl. So I'm just telling you, this is society we live. We're change agents. You all are not using it, but you may come across some that have. And so put this stuff in your purse. This doesn't make you, does it make you feel dirty to have Narcan? What are other Christians going to say they see Narcan in my purse? Who cares? You might save somebody's life. Well, I don't even know what Narcan is. Shame on you when people are dying. And since we started this church service today, we have lost people in Porter County to overdose deaths. And some of them are church kids. Or church adults. Woo! This is heavy, isn't it? But don't y'all forget, these are just statistics to empower us to be our purpose. I hope y'all not falling on the dark shadows here. This is just information because this can be sound bad. So look. It's hard to believe 50% of all Americans have subprime credit. Do you know Christians should be paying their debt? You know you shouldn't be running from creditors as Christians? You're looking at your caller, like, oh, Lord, ain't answering that call, child. That's J.C. Penny calling. And we are spending more than we make. We're spending more than we make, and if somebody, if you, and the deacon or the elder better not get up and say, hey, you know, as a believer, you should be paying your tithes and your offer. Hey, all they do is want money. But then you run out here, and you overcharge your credit card, and you won't be able to pay it off in 15 years, and you're going to pay 10 times what you pay for that one item, but you get an attitude with the church when they want to do tithes and offer. Well, what's your credit score? Oh, child, my credit score is a 550. Well, there ain't nothing to brag about. <laughs> Hey, 
as believers. Come on now, we believers. We are stewards. We should be wise stewards. Man, these stats are covering everything, and now he's just in my bed. He needs to leave that alone. Look at that. Of all major industrialized nations, America is the most obese. Mexico is number two. We got to take care of ourselves. We in the this body is the temple of what? The Holy Spirit. Man, I stood in the, in the mirror yesterday. I said, "Oh my God, I'm a, my butt better." Just go. Oh my God, I got to do something with that. I hold myself personally accountable for that. At one point, I couldn't even see my toes. I ain't like that now because when we, we got come off, I got a little better. I was 214 pounds. Now I'm somewhere around 207 pounds. But at least I'm conscious of it. And every once in a while, I sin because I sit there, I eat a chocolate cake, a strawberry cake, and ice cream. And do some pizza on top of it. I said, all right, now I'm getting a little too far. But at least we got to hold ourselves personally accountable for that. That's personal accountability. And I am leading the pack with messing up in that area. But it, but it still doesn't alleviate the fact that I, can't pre I shouldn't be preaching it. Because I mean, ow, I was more I said, ow to me. Miss McLaurin be eating those, those potato pies. She better stop. And I'm only using her because she get on me all the time. Pastor, watch your food now. You, know, you shouldn't be eating that. So I'm just picking on her because she picks on me. And you need those people to hold you accountable. Now, Pastor, you got to be careful. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You, you right, Evangel. You right, Evangel. She get on me. And I love every bit of it. She said, Pastor, you got to take care of yourself. My wife show get them. Don't get me get on that. Lord, I be eating salad and beans, <laughs> tofu, <laughs> veggie crumbles. <laughs> so don't don't bring my wife in the mix, boy. <laughs> there you now. Lord help me, Jesus. She get on me, boy. But the doctor told her, cause she had stage four cancer. If you weren't eating the way you were eating, you'd be dead today. So I don't hate her for it. I just ain't all the way over there yet, but I'm getting over there. Went to Michigan the other day. Deacon Wilson made me buy a whole thing of beef prime rib roast. Made me do it. He made me do it. He made me do it. $6.99 a pound. You can't get beef prime rib roast $6.99 a pound in Indiana. He he mentioned a quarter of the thing. What he made me do? He made me buy some jumbo chicken wings. Ten pounds of them. Lord Jesus. Made me buy. Made me buy them chicken wings so thick and juicy. Lord Jesus. They can only pay $14 for that. But see how we laughing, right? But it don't make it less true. We got to watch ourselves. We got to exercise. We got to take care of these temples on a consistent basis. I've noticed once I exercise, I feel better. I live better. I breathe better. I even have better sex. You don't need a Viagra. I just was wondering if Alana was paying attention that time. She was paying attention. I'm just telling you, when you exercise, your body functions properly. Wait till you get married, Lon. I ain't telling no story. Only one state in the entire country, only one state in the entire country has an obese rate under 20%. Only one state. 11 states have an obesity rate over 30%. Back in 1962, only 13% of all Americans were obese. But it is being projected that 42% of all Americans be obese by 2030. It's astounding. And a lot of it has to do with stuff they put in our food. And the other thing is that we get comfortable we stay in the house too much. 
Corruption is rampant throughout our society. In fact, America leads the world in money given to fake charities. Without strong families, our young people are constantly in search of an identity. According to the FBI, there are now more than 1.4 million gang members involved in 33,000 active criminal gangs in the United States. In 2012, the latest full year that we have numbers for, the rate of violence crime in the United States increased by 15%. The average young American will spend 10,000 hours playing video games before the age 21. Thank God for KOZ. 10,000 hours of playing video game before the age of 21. One study discovered that 88% of all Americans from the age of 8 to 18 play video games and that approximately four times as many boys are addicted to video games as girls. And as a result, SAT scores have been falling for years. And the level of education that our kids are receiving in most public schools is a total joke. You don't believe that? Look at the lives of all your little favorite politicians you vote for and see how many of them in public school. See how many is in the public school system that they said your kids got to go to or they're going to get picked up and, go to, and you don't get in trouble for them. Just see. Look. When was the last time as a parent you went to the, your school system and you observed the education that your child was getting? As a parent, when was the last time you made a personal appointment to meet with teachers or guidance counselors to see what was going on with your child and it was not a PTA meeting? Come on. This, this, I'm talking to believers, but this is the message that you got to take to people because church people do this kind of stuff. I know church, we do this kind of stuff. There was a woman giving my daughter a hard time one time. I said, what? Went to the school with her. They expected to be the mother. They didn't expect it to be the father. Went in there. So the teacher, you, see, you say your part. Teacher went in and said her part. When my daughter got ready to talk, she was going to try to shut her down. I said, excuse me, ma'am. We didn't disturb you when you was talking. My daughter's time to talk. When Ross began to talk, oh, well, do tell. Whole situation changed. We went in there cussing, fussing nobody out. We went through due process. And that woman left my child alone. We went in there cussing, acting unseen, Christian. But she tried to shut my child down and not give her a voice. And then how many of your kids come home and come, oh, shut up. Ain't nothing. You just need to do what you got to do. Sometimes they do your child wrong. And you got to go set and you got to listen objectively without cussing and acting a fool in the school and see what's really going on with your child. Kids bring felon grades home. They, they, they don't mind bringing felon grades. Man, I made an F one time. I hit that report card to the carnival. was gone. I was afraid to bring an F home to my mama. I was afraid to bring a D home, actually. Because I had the potential and the capability. Now, if I didn't have the potential capability, that would be a different story. But my mother knew what my potential was. I took chemistry in college. That was the best D I ever made in my life. And I think the lady gave me the D. That was a good D. Because I did the best I could. If the best you could is a D, then so be it. But some of our kids can do way more better than a D. And they still got a hundred dollar ten shoes on a cell phone. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. They still got a TV in their room. I don't understand it. Come on now. Saints, I'm preaching. I'm preaching today. I'm, I'm telling you this is. So the average SAT scores have been falling for years. And the level of education is just not good. At this point, 15-year-olds that attend public schools do not even rank in the top half of all industrialized nations when it comes to math and science literacy. We live in times when most employers no longer care about their employees. As I wrote about the other day, a company that Warren Buffett 
has a controlling interest in, has decided to shut down a factory in Kentucky and move it to Honduras just so that they can make a little bit more money. As a result, 600 workers is going to lose their jobs. There are more than 3 million reports of child abuse in the United States every single year. According to recent Pew Research Center survey, 60% of all Americans believe that humans and other living things have evolved over time, while only 33% are, uh, are, re are responded, rejected this statement. Nearly one-fifth of all U.S. adults have no religious affiliation whatsoever. Back in 1972, only 7% of all U.S. adults had no religious affiliation. The number of Americans with no religious affiliation has grown 25% over the last five years. And the younger you are, the more likely you are not to be affiliated with a religion. 9% of all U.S. adults that are 65 and older have no longer religious affiliation, but a, but a, a whopping 32% of all U.S. adults under the age of 30 have no religious affiliation. 80% of those that are religiously unaffiliated are not looking for religion. 73% of all religiously unaffiliated unaffili support gay marriages, and 72% of the religious affiliated support legalization of abortion. The religiously unaffiliated now make up 24% of all registered voters who are Democrats or lean Democratic. This is just research. I'm not trying to mess with your, your I, don't know, I don't claim either. For the first time ever, ever Protestants do not make up the majority of the U.S. population. Do not. Protestants. The church. Christian church. In 2007, Protestants made up 53% of all the U.S. population, but now only 48% of the U.S. population. Way back in 1972, Protestants made up 62% of the U.S. population. 29% of all U.S. adults seldom or never attend a religious service. 51% of all U.S. adults believe that church and other religion organizations are too concerned with money than power. How many of y'all here believe that? Church is too much, too concerned with money. How many of y'all here have a personal belief that church is too concerned with getting your money? If you believe that, if you believe that, I also want you to research. Just take a research. I give, I give Carol partial permission, not to show names, just, just to give you research. Do you know that people that give liberally into this ministry are financially stable? And people that do not give liberally are not financially stable. Are in lack. Because giving is a principle. And when you practice the giving principle, God will bless you. Giving is a principle. And let me say this to you. And I need, to, I need to say this just to be saying it, to give you research opportunities. A giver is not, quote, unquote, just something that would benefit a Christian. Gravity works for a believer and non-believer. Gravity is a law. It's a principle. Bill Gates lives on 10% of his income. He gives away 90 But the 10% he lives on way exceeds what the average person in the world would ever come in. But the more the philanthropists give out, the more. Why would Bill Gates and Warren Buffett give each other money? <laughs> Giving is for your benefit. But do you know there's people that come to church? that says, I ain't going to that church. All they want is your money. When you look in their lives, they are financially strapped, and they really need to be sowing their money. But you won't ever say that here, because if you don't give, we're going to make it. This is not about us trying to get your money. This is about us trying to get you to a place where you can have financial freedom in your life by supporting kingdom work. There's a lot of Christians. Do you know that if every Christian in this church tied, we'd already have a new building? We wouldn't have to be believing God for the miraculous one donor to come in and give us $4.1 million. If everybody in the church tied, 
10% of what comes into your hand, we would already have a new building. Do you know if we got 50 people in here, we probably got a consistent 12 tithers and everybody else tipping God? Those that take offering will tell you that. Praise the Lord. I love this church. I love this church. I love the people of God. Your giving don't look like it. Carol can print an annual statement on some of y'all. The giving for a whole year is probably $88. Am I lying? My mama don't go to this church, and she gives a whole lot of year to this church. She's not even a member. Oh, we got quiet, didn't we? And I don't say that to bring condemnation. It's just as much a fact as anything else I've read. I don't know. We barely make it. That's because you barely give it. The Bible says he that sows sparingly reaps. He that sows Liberally, bountifully, we'll reap. It's a law. It's a principle. The average American, well, I ain't going to church. All they want is my money. No, I don't want your money. And if you give like that, keep it. Right? Come on, Saints. Come on, let's buy a t shirt. 66% of all U.S. adults believe that religion is losing its influence on American life. And it is because church becomes a, a marketplace, begging place, everything but lifting up Jesus place. Everything but prayer place. And so the churches are having to subscribe to the ways of the world. But we ain't doing that! According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the number of Americans with no religion more than double between 1990 and 2008. According to the American Religion Identification Survey, only 76% of all Americans identify themselves as Christians of one type or another in 2008. Back in 1990, 86% of all Americans identified themselves as Christians of one type or another. A study conducted by the Burner Group discovered that nearly 60% of all Christians from 15 years of age to 29 years of age no longer actively is involved in any church. Actively involved. Actively involved. Come on, you see that? It has been projected that the percentage of Americans attending church in 2050 will be about half of what it is today. But this is 2023. Please don't bank on 2050 being here. Don't even bank on 2024 being here. But we can't see the decline. There are still people who haven't returned to church since the pandemic. One survey conducted a while back found that 52% of all American Christians believe that at least one non-Christian faith can lead to eternal life. Let me read that again. One survey conducted a while back found that 52% of all American Christians believe that at least some non-Christian faith can lead to eternal life. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man can go to the Father but by me. But we have Christians that believe that other Christians that don't accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior are going to make it to heaven. It's not happening. According to a LifeWay research, 46% of all Christians never even think about whether they will go to heaven or not. Did I say Americans or did I say Christians? Let me say Americans. According, no, no, let me reread that. According to LifeWay Research, 46% of all Americans, Americans never even think about whether they will go to heaven or not. Whoa! So we have been called in a time like this to leave this place with a purpose and a passion to do what? Reconcile the lost and dying world that fit these statistics back to Christ. That young man, right on the verge of being suicidal, says, Pastor, I got to tell you, I don't believe in Jesus. When someone says that to you, love has to kick in to say, well, you may not, but I'm still here for you. 
Because what they're going to find is the Jesus that they didn't believe in has manifested himself to them through you. Your marriage is going to represent Jesus. Your life is going to represent Jesus. Your family is going to represent Jesus. How you work on your job is going to represent Jesus. There was a Hindu man that called me. Hindu. He don't accept Jesus the way we accept Jesus. Elder used to do some work for him. He called me. He said, can, can you find me somebody else like Elder? I said, no, there's nobody else like Elder. There's nobody else like that. He's a great man. He does great work. What did that bring glory to? Not Elder, but to Jesus. Hindu man called a Christian man and said, can you find me somebody else like another Christian? I said, no, I can't find anybody else like that because that man, that man, there's not another man like that that you can acquire that's going to work for great fervency just to represent his Lord. You should be the best worker on your job. You should be the most proficient worker on your job. You should be on time on your job. You shouldn't be stealing ink pens on your job. You shouldn't take unauthorized breaks on your job. Come on, why? Because we glorify God. Come on, Gary. You know, you no, I can't take a break. I'm on the clock. They pay me to do this. Why? Because the Lord, I do this unto the Lord, not unto these, this company or whatever. I do this unto the Lord. Now, you go do what you're going to do, but I got to do what I got to do. You can't fit in. You got to be a part of the solution. They got to see Jesus in you in every situation. Oh, Lord. Well, can I close out reading some scriptures? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 20, verse 5. Now, we're still going to hit Nehemiah, but I don't know. I got diverted, didn't I? Okay, so Isaiah, we're going to read some stuff, and we're going to, going, to, going to do a little picture here. And then don't y'all miss, because this thing is going to be progressive. But I told you all I want to do is to lay a foundation. I want you to leave here understanding your why. I want you to leave here with a desire to pursue your purpose. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 is where we're going to start. But I, but, and I want to do that by just reading to you some statistics just to show you what, what type of situation we're in so that you can realize that you are so very important in the time that you live because you are not the problem. You are the answer. You are the solution to your uh, the environment that you live in. Amen? So I'm going to read now. I'm going to read and then we're going to close. How many of y'all tired of me? Not even quite 12. Isaiah 5 and 20. We okay, Cherie? You got me, Cherie? Cherie been with me all day. You with me, Cherie? We in there? We in there? <laughs> Bless the Lord. What sorrow? Isaiah 5 20. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. Not a good thing for people to say evil is good. You know, be careful in society. You'll start accepting stuff. Oh, that's okay. They're not bothering nobody. It's not, that's not a good position for a Christian, right? That dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes? And think themselves to be so clever. What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine and boast about it, or boast about all the alcohol they can hold. Have you ever heard somebody do that? Yeah, I used to do it. Who was that laughing back there? Yeah, I, man, I could drink. I could throw. Then you hear people, man, didn't we have a good time last night? Yeah, we did, man. Ooh, boy. So what sorrow away for those? It says sorrow away for those. You see that? They take bribes and let the wicked go free, and they punish the innocent. Therefore, just as fire licks up stubble and dry grass shrivels in the flame, so their root will rot and their flowers will what? Wither, for they have rejected the law of the Lord, arm, of law of the Lord of heaven's armies. They have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Reading that gives a Christian, when we come in contact with people that are not living according to the word of God, they're boasting about evil things, they're calling good things evil, there should some well up in us that says, Lord, help, have mercy. 
that should we have something to well up in us not to judge. Because you can't judge, no, you don't judge no man. But there should be something about the love of God in you that want to connect with this person to keep judgment from hitting their life. Not your judgment, God's judgment. See, sometimes we do too much of the judging. We isolate ourselves from people because we we have declared them to be unclean. So then we don't we're not as effective. But when we see this, it should activate something in us that says, "Lord, help me to help them." Not judge them, but what? Help them. Are y'all working with me? Verse 25 says, "This is why the Lord's anger burned against his people and why he has raised his fist to crush them. The mountains tremble and the corpse of his people litter the streets like garbage. But even then the Lord's anger is not satisfied for his fist is still poised to what? Strike. He will send a signal to a distant nation far away and a whistle to those at the ends of the earth and they will come racing toward Jerusalem and they will not get tired or stumble. They will not stop for rest or sleep. Not a belt will be loose. Not a sandal Strap broken, their arrows will be sharp and their bows ready for battle. Spark will fly from their horses' ho horse hooves. Let me get a, the iPad was getting excited. Stop that. Hallelujah. Are y'all working with me? And the wheels of their chairs will spin like whirlwinds and they will roar like lions, like strongest, strongest of lions, growling. They will pounce on their victims and carry them off and no one will be there to rescue them. They will roar over their victims on that day of what? Destruction. Like a roaring of a sea. If someone look across the land, only darkness and distress will be seen. Even the light will be darkened by what? Clouds. Do you understand that if our nation keep going into the direction that it's going, destruction will hit this nation as never before? We would have thought that the uh, Katrina, when it wiped out New Orleans and that area down there, it would have brought some repentance. We would have thought that one, one, I don't know if it was night or morning, that I was in Japan and I watched those planes hit those twin towers and brought down that tower. We would have thought it would have brought, and then they tell me that in this country, churches were full when that happened. I don't know, I wasn't here, but they tell me people start going back to church. Then just after a little while, if people get back comfortable, turn back to their own stuff. Churches turn back to their programs, their schedules. Hats Day, Men's Day, Women's Day, Children's Day, Money Day, Bread Day, Fish Day, Choir Day, Rehearsal Day, but no evangelism. Got that call yesterday. I went to a preacher house. Just got a call. Got back getting ready to lose his life. Want to take his life. Do you want to go on this ride with me? Well, no. I got some work to do around the building. I got work to do around the building. Come on now. I'm about to take my life. Hey, man, you want to go with me on this call? No. I got some got to, got to work on the building. You see how we missed it? Yeah. I had to work on the building. I got a program to attend. Praise the Lord. But we want there to be a great revival. We want our family saved. We want there to be changed. But we got to cut the grass. We're going to build it. But look at this, y'all. Y'all know I'm not going to stop, stop this in a negative way. Y'all know that. So I'm keep reading it. <laughs> Isaiah chapter, we will not stop in a negative way. So then we look at Isaiah 6. We're so famous with this, but you got to understand Isaiah 5 preceded Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 preceded with darkness. But look, anytime there's darkness, God is going to raise up somebody to be light, right? It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him 
were mighty seraphims, each one having six wings. With two wings they covered his face. Two wings they covered his feet. With two they flew. They were calling out to each other like the song that the team sang today. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's army. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to the foundation. The presence of God was being made manifest. And the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, when did he say it? In the presence of God. Then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed. For I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips. And I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king. The Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. With a burning coal. Had taken from the altar with a pair of tongues. And he touched my lips with it. And said, see. This coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed. And your sins are forgiven. That's us, y'all. Then in verse 8, I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to this people to deal with this these, these, all of these atrocities, this 100 line items I just read to you, who can I send to be an answer to all of these problems? That's us, y'all. Who can go? He said, who will go for us? Who will go? Out of all of this mess I've read, I want to know who is willing to go, who is willing to make a difference, who is willing to demonstrate the glory of God, who is willing who is willing to go beyond just a church program, a two-hour service, that's it for them? Who Who's willing to go? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me, Lord. How many here am I do I have in here today? How many people do I have today that send me, I'll go? And he said, yes, go. You go to God and you say, send me, I'll go. God going to say every time, yes, get up and go. He's not going to say no. He's going to say go. I have read to you a lot of messes going on in this nation. God said, who will go and be the difference? All you got to do is say, that'll be me. I'll go. I understand the love and the compassion of God. I'll go. I understand from where God brought me from. I'll go. Who's willing to go and testify about just how good God has been in your life? Saints, there's a divine call in the body of Christ stronger now than ever before. And we have to say yes to the Lord. Inside and outside the building. Inside and outside. I'll go join deaconship on a Friday night. I know what it means to be like on the streets. I'll go. I'll go on a Tuesday morning and work with the ladies. I'll go. I want the building to be clean when somebody come in here where the glory of God won't be disrespected. I'll join Deacon and scraping the floor. I'll go. I'll do it. It's all hands on deck. Because this thing is almost over. The rapture of the church is imminent. We got family not saved. We got friends not saved. We got people that need the Lord. Co-workers everywhere. Drug addiction, mental health, all time How We need some people to take the peace of Jesus. So everything that I read today just set you up with who's willing to go. The problem's out there. It's not in here. God bless you guys. I know we're working on getting our lives together. Your sins have been forgiven if you are a believer. There's no condemnation over your life. You've been free. You liberated. Fourth of July, Declaration of Independence. You've been free. Jesus has set you free. Now he says, now go. Father, we thank you for the mandate that you've placed on our lives. You've identified our whys to seek and save those that are lost. You identified our why because it's dark out there. We need to be a light. That's our why. You've identified our why because we know judgment is coming. We see judgment is coming, God, and we want to do something about it. 
So I speak over the life of every believer in this house. That the Holy Ghost will stir us up and begin to burn us with purpose. The Holy Ghost will begin to reveal to us our whys. Begin to stir our passion. Because we were on the way to a devil's hell. There was times that a lot of us, God, should have been dead and in our grave. But you said no because you had a purpose for us. You had a work for us. And we're standing now, God, understanding the conditions of our community, saying, here am I, I'll go. Send me. Lord, I thank you. I pray, God, for your provision, your protection over your people, the empowerment of your spirit to be released in each and every one of our lives. God, that we'll leave here more vigilant and our eyes are open to opportunities to be used by you. No matter how small or how great, God, every opportunity that you give us, help us to seize it. Speak truth in love. We will not leave here with a Pharisee spirit as if we're better because we're not. But we'll leave here with a heart of compassion and love. Not wanting to see any man perish. Preserve our marriages, help our children, help us to be good stewards of the things that you've given us, help us in every aspect of our life, Father, so that we can be that that we need to be to whomever we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. As we tithe and give offerings. We are believing God for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and good surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give to the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Just like some of you have testimonies, I got a piece of mail in the mail. I think it came just last week. It says you have a piece of mail.